I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast, the week starting Sunday, August 1st. Storm Surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, real data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean, we see not a whole lot going on. Remnants of a gale producing 20-foot seas in the far southeast Pacific, and some sort of low-pressure system north of New Zealand falling southeast, but not really doing anything yet. Let's get into the details. As usual, we'll start looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales when they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, and unfortunately, we don't really see one. There's a bit of... A trough is wind pushing to the north in the southern hemisphere in the southern branch of the jet. This is the northern branch. This is the southern branch here. And we're looking for this, something like this, but positioned in the California swell window. What this does is help create a clockwise flow aloft and down at the ocean surface. That's the hallmark of low pressure. Of course, low pressure, if it's deep enough or strong enough, generates winds. Winds, if they're strong enough, generate seas. Seas, if they're high enough, as they radiate away from the fetch area, turn into swell. Of course, swell when it hits your beach turns into surf. But unfortunately, right now, we have the opposite of a trough. Yeah, there is sort of a very weak trough here in the far southeast Pacific, but the Southern California swell window cutoffs about 118 west, right about there. And the peak of this trough is well east of there. So this is really only uh, affecting, we'll say, Chile and Peru. But what we have is the opposite, a ridge. Winds pushing hard south into Antarctica. And when you get this split, split jet stream flow like we have here, that sets up high pressure in between. The ice line right now off of Antarctica is about 63, 62, maybe even up to 60 south. So there. So there is literally no room for any gale to develop. Let's go take a look at the forecast. We'll roll out into Monday. You see the ridge continues. The sort of a trough trying to develop in the southeast Pacific and winds start pushing north as we get into Tuesday in the far southeast Pacific and maybe trying to get some traction, but almost pretty much pushing out of the window of the southern california swell window by wednesday and we're out of luck there the ridge starts letting up under new zealand on wednesday but there's nothing again to really there's no trough nothing pushing to the north to help create that low pressure that we're looking for and if anything a bit of a ridge tries to build in as we get into thursday and even stronger on Friday. There you go, full ridge pattern, split jet stream flow. I mean, we're just not in a good place right now. Saturday, a bit of a trough tries to develop under New Zealand with winds to 100 knots. You really need 120 knot winds or so. And then even that falls apart as we get into Sunday a week from now. The ridging pattern continues. We're 180 hours out now and just Literally, it doesn't look like anything is supportive of gale development in the upper levels of the atmosphere. Let's go take a look down at the surface and see if that gives us any better uh, uh, hope. Here we are, surface level pressure, surface level winds as expected, high pressure in control, a 1032 millibar high here, filling the west and most of the central Pacific. Bit of weak low pressure here in the far southeast Pacific, but winds only 30 to 35 knots. You're not going to get anything from that. Then here's this low that we're looking at north of New Zealand. So we get into Monday. That low falls south, but winds, it is producing winds, 35 knot winds, but they're all aimed south at Antarctica. Nothing aimed at us or even Hawaii, really. A little bit of fetch here. We're keeping our eyes, though, because here we go. As we get into Tuesday, the low is supposed to build a little bit, producing south fetch, 35-knot winds in the Hawaiian swell window. I mean, that's good for 13, maybe 14-second period swell. You know, you can tell the period a lot by just the wind strength, assuming there it's over decent-sized fetch area and it holds for a decent amount of time. And as we get into Tuesday night, Wednesday, 35 knot winds out of the south continue to build. So there's some some hope there for Hawaii. It's a cutoff low. Um, so not typically they're not super strong. And even into Thursday, 
30, 35, almost a little tiny area, 40 knot winds. But we know the jet's pretty much like diving down here somewhere. So it's cut off from the main energy source, the southern branch of the jet, and that's what would really feed it. So we're into, uh, what was it, Friday night now? Literally nothing other than that one low that we're looking at. We're into uh, Sunday now. Still just kind of this fragmented, messy pattern no real fetch, cohesive, solid fetch areas of interest forecast. So, but that's no surprise based on what we saw looking at the jet stream. All right, let's go take a look at the wave models. What effect will these winds have on the ocean surface? Now we're going back in time to last Sunday. This is the last gale that has formed in any recent memory, there is swell, we believe, radiating north. In fact, if you look in California, the buoys, there's tiny, I mean, like nine inches to maybe one foot this evening, pushing into southern and northern California at like 20 seconds, something like that. That originated from this sort of pair of gales a week ago. Here you go, 30 three foot seas right here and notice this they're lifting well to the northeast or they lifted well to the northeast sunday night 31 foot seas fading 26 foot seas on monday morning more 27 foot seas into the evening and then gone that swell poised to hit we'll say peak of it somewhere in california in the late monday early tuesday into sometime on wednesday sort of time frame thing but then after that things go dead so there was this other gale uh, last thursday friday in the far southeast pacific but it only produced well there was the peak 20 22 24 foot seas 24.7 to be exact uh actually no that's not right that uh that that's a this down here is a different system. Where is 68 West? Oh, that's over here. Okay, so so this, yeah, 24 foot seas. Maybe there'll be some 13 second period swell at the most exposed breaks in Southern California, but we'll, we've pretty much even written that off. And then we're into, where are we? We're into this morning and still nothing going on. All right, let's go take a look at the forecast. All right, 18Z on Sunday, the latest run of the model. Oh, and also notice the ice line here, 62 south, maybe down to 64 there, and up to almost exactly 60 south there. So the uh, Southern Hemi is in the peak of its winter time frame, but m the downside of that is you go, oh, great, we're going to get storms. But the downside is you also have maximum coverage of ice. So as the storms push across the South Pacific, if they're over ice, well, no luck there. And pretty much, you know, this is the main storm window. They call it the Roaring Forties, but really from about 55 south is where to, you know, about 65 south is where all the real action happens in most normal years. So a lot less open ocean to contend with. Anyway, so we move into Tuesday. We know there's this gale thing trying to develop here um, east of New Zealand. As we get into Tuesday night, 20, 22 foot seas over a small area. And that's about, we get 23 foot seas right in there. Um, and that's about as much as we get. We think we'll get some swell for Hawaii, 13, 14 second period swell. Then a secondary fetch down here. What is that? 20, 22, 24, 26 foot seas over a tiny area. Theoretically on Friday, that's almost a week out. Too far to be believable. Notice a lot of activity south of Australia. It wants to push under New Zealand. But watch this. It's like there's almost a brick wall right here. It just doesn't really let anything through. Uh, the Fiji uh, swell window up here through the Tasman Sea. In fact, let's go back and do a quick examination. Yes, so see this. There is Fiji. I believe it's right in there somewhere. So there is energy pushed up in there. And maybe some of that will reach Hawaii. But after it gets filtered, filtered by the islands, Pretty small indeed. Whoops. And there we are. We're into Sunday night and just really nothing for the South Pacific, unfortunately, other than this little window here and other than the little low that we saw east of New Zealand. So that sends us on the search for wind swell. All right. And we have high pressure. I mean, it is that time of the year, right? High pressure in the North Pacific. 
1032 millibar high, winds circulate clockwise around it, but the high is a little bit displaced off to the west, not creating any fetch really along the California coast. There was no swell really to speak of today. There may be some thigh high sets at select breaks in Northern California. Now the one thing, Hurricane Hilda is right down here. We'll talk about that in a minute, though. There's not a whole lot to talk about. But there is good uh, fetch pushing into the Hawaiian Islands. They're buried right under here somewhere. Uh, 15 to 20 knot easterly trade. So wind swell for the east-facing shores of the Hawaiian Islands. That continues into Monday. Still no real fetch for uh, north and central California. A big solid area of fetch as we get into Tuesday for the Hawaiian Islands. So good easterly wind swell. More on Wednesday. Uh, you can see bits of Hilda here. We'll get into that in a minute. I'm just going to completely blow by that. But you see, basically, Hilda fades out here and is not of any particular concern. As we get into, oh, let's go back. Let me look at California because I did miss that. As we get into Thursday, Fetch finally gets a little bit cohesive off of, so we'll say, Point Arena and southward into Central California. So maybe some wind swell on Thursday. Building to 25 knots later, so building wind swell, but really raw. Same deal early Friday and continuing into Friday. So maybe some wind swell there. Fetch fading for the Hawaiian Islands and the, the tropical fetch. Yes, here is the what's left of uh, Hilda creating a little bit of a gradient with high pressure here. This is low pressure, and that might enhance the trade wind swell a little bit. So we get into Saturday, still just a little bit of fetch off of California. Trade wind trades pretty much fade out relative to the Hawaiian Islands. And then Sunday, a week from now, yes, yeah, still maybe low odds for tiny wind swell early but then even that looks like it's fading out uh this is that time of the year as you get into august the trade the the trade winds if you will uh and that means north winds for california they typically fade out the southern hemi a lot of times somewhere in mid-july it's later this year it was pretty much the end of july where the southern hemi fades out and kind of it's not over but it sort of just pauses for three to four weeks, something like that. And you start moving towards the transition when hopefully the North Pacific will wake up as we move into September. Don't know if that's going to be the case, but we are definitely in that doldrums period where we're, we're in between seasons, we're ready to start moving to fall, but we're not quite there yet. Quick look at Hurricane Hilda, 70 knot Winds, gusts not available, pressure 980 millibars, that's not very low. Not a particularly well-organized storm, uh, heading off west-northeast, I believe it was 8 knot. Latest spaghetti plot from Tropical Tidbits, um, notice uh, 10, 1,003 millibars here, it's saying, and then slowly rising over the next, what's that, four, six days, something like I said, these are in two, yeah, four, six-day increments. Um, so, and a spread of potential different positions, but generally heading off in a west-northwest to west pattern later. And we'll go look at the GFS model now. And this is today, and we're just going to put this in motion. See the storm? It does lift northwest, but weakening. Will there be swell for California from it? say the odds are probably pretty low it's not a very big storm and then it just kind of fades off and dies so we are not at all hopeful for swell maybe a little bit of something into southern california but whatever it generates there will be more longer period more legitimate swell hitting at the same time so any defined swell from hilda in and of itself will probably be masked and just a quick look at temperatures. This is Squaw Valley, but we're just going to use it as a proxy for the whole Sierra. Uh, the point being the freezing level still. So lately, the past two days, it's been down about 12,500 feet. But by uh, actually today, going up above 14,000 feet and expected to stay that way for the next um, 10 days this is a 10 day run of the GFS model. So no obvious sign of any cold fronts, any hints of fall moving into California at this time. All right, let's go to look long term. What's going on with the Madden-Julian oscillation and the El Nino Southern oscillation? 
these two uh, weather oscillation systems, whatever you want to call them, are probably the largest determiner of potential for storm development and therefore surf in either the northern or hemi or southern hemi. Uh, so that's why we monitor them. All right, so as usual, we're looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO. The MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, is this, it's a, either in the active state, it's, it's a low pressure system. In the inactive state, it's a high pressure system. The active and inactive state rotate around the planet. When there's, wherever the active size uh, phase is, the inactive size phase is on the other side of the planet. Right, the active phase, which of course is the one we're looking for because it acts like low pressure, it imparts energy to the jet stream, and of course that helps feed the storm track. It also can create or dampen trade winds when it's over the West Pacific. That in turn can take warm water that's there, like over here in the West Pacific, and start pushing it east in the form of a Kelvin wave. Multiple successive Kelvin waves can either be a sign or can actually kick off um, El Nino. And of course we all know that El Nino is like multiple active phases of the MJO stationed right over the Pacific. And that, of course, can create a lot of surf and a lot of precipitation and nasty weather uh, later on in the winter. All right. But anyway, so for right now, we're looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO. This is data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung over the equator used for monitoring El Nino. They also have wind sensors on them. The arrows are the five-day average wind from those sensors. So you can see winds in the east Pacific here. This is the West Pacific here. Here's the equator. That's New Guinea right there. Dateline is right there, the international dateline, so that it helps orient you. Winds are strong out of the east over the East Pacific, pretty strong out of the east over the Central Pacific, and then what we call the Kelvin wave generation area, the West Pacific. When the active phase is over here, it can create Kelvin waves to kick off El Nino. It can also this is the area where most of the energy from the active phase of the MJO is imparted into the jet stream. So we watch it closely. But we see winds, they're out of the east, but not as strong as they are over the West Pacific. So maybe that's a good sign. But it is anomalies. The differences from normal for this time of year that we're mainly interested in. So yeah, the wind's pretty strong out of the east. But looking at these arrows, you see that, well... Yeah, they're a little bit stronger out of the east and the very far east Pacific, but otherwise that's pretty normal. Same deal over the central Pacific. And in the Kelvin wave generation area, there is the same deal, pretty much normal. So one could conclude that there is neither an active or inactive phase of the MJO going on over the Pacific at this moment. So what have winds been doing for the past five days, the previous five days? All right, so what are we looking at here? Well, there's South America. There's Central America, there's Hawaii, there's New Guinea, there's the Philippines, zero. That's the equator running right there. This is the whole planet. So the Kelvin wave generation area, that's where we're most interested in, is right here. And what are we looking at? This is the east-west component of the wind, wind anomalies. Are the winds stronger out of the east, which would be in enhanced trades, or stronger out of the west? Oh, enhanced trades, that would mean the inactive phase of the MJO. Uh, or westerly anomalies, the exact opposite of enhanced trades, um, would suggest the active phase of the MJO. And that's what we want to see. So, July 26, here's the Kelvin wave generation area right in here. Now, well, maybe a little bit of westerly anomalies, but they kind of faded on the 27th. Faded a little bit more and moved east to the Central Pacific on the 28th. The 29th, they pretty much dissipated in the Central Pacific, and then here we are now. It's kind of this mixed bag pattern, neither indicative of the active phase or the inactive phase, pretty much neutral. Let's go look at the forecast for the next week. So here we go. This is the east-west component of the wind over the entire planet, so let's orient ourselves. Well, there's the date line right there. It goes right up the middle of the chart. And this is time down here. So August 1st, that's today. And this is the next seven-day forecast. Yellows and oranges are westerly anomalies. Blues are easterly anomalies. So Kelvin wave generation area starts far west Pacific, about 135 east. So right there. So we're interested from there 
to about right there to 170 west. This is the Kelvin wave generation area. So we see west pockets of westerly anomalies today, but they give way to easterly anomalies. And those easterly anomalies, as we get into August 6 or so, start building and almost fill the Kelvin wave generation area. Not very strong, but this sort of suggests a developing uh, weak inactive phase of the MJO. Now, to put things in a little bit more perspective, this would be a stronger inactive phase of the MJO. So, inactive phase of the MJO, then here, this is the Indian Ocean over here. Active phase of the MJO, trying to make its way across the Pacific. You can see it, right? And into the forecast into next week. But then, behind it, the inactive phase developing again, and not a strong active phase at all. At least, that's our interpretation looking at this chart. Let's dig a little deeper. All right, so if the active phase of the MJO is like low pressure, well, typically with low pressure, you get clouds, right? Okay, and clouds would mean you'd see less sunlight reflecting off the ocean surface, right? So these are, these charts are outgoing long wave radiation, or fancy words for cloud cover, sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface. The equator is right there, EQ, right? There's South America, Peru right there. There's the Galapagos. Central America, uh, Hawaii, New Guinea, Kelvin wave generation area, 135 east, which would be right about there. So this block right out to the date line. There's the date line right there, 180. So right in there, that's the box. The yellows are more sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface, meaning high pressure, meaning the inactive phase of the MJO. So right now we're kind of neutral, right? That's what it looks like. Five days from now, uh, building uh, dry air, building no clouds, building more on 10 days out, building more on 15 days out. Looks like this per the statistic model, right? The CA model, the statistic model, suggests inactive phase building for the next 15 days. The dynamic model, the GEFS, says pretty much the same thing, but not nearly as strong. So maybe a much weaker inactive phase of the MJO. And okay, we'll take that. That wouldn't be so bad. And now the upper level model. This just is a same sort of deal. Instead of clouds, it's potential for precipitation. The greens are areas favorable for precipitation. We call it the active phase of the MJO. Yellows and orange, dry air. And this is up at the jet stream level, uh, not favorable for precipitation, inactive phase of the MJO. Eight different panels, five days each panel, South America, Central America, equator right there. There's New Guinea, you can just barely see Hawaii there. Philippines, Kelvin wave generation area right here. So you can pretty much see it. Here's the Indian Ocean, inactive phase, moving from west to east over the maritime continent pulling into the Pacific on August 16th, continuing the whole way across the Pacific, poised to push over Central America at the end of the model run. Oh, and let's go down here just a little bit more. There we go. The 10th of September. And then here's the active phase. Very weak. See the greens moving from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent and into the Pacific uh, beginning of September. So what's this suggest? It pretty much suggests that uh, August is a write-off and our next opportunity for real storm development is in September. That's not good. I don't need a month to take care of business and do chores. I want my surf now. But, well, it is what it is. Let's keep digging. Phase diagrams, another way of looking at the MJO. Okay, so kind of a strange picture. But consider the the MJO moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean over the Maritime Continent, out over the West Pacific, the East Pacific, across Central America, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over North Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot is where the active phase is right now. So in the East Pacific, the further away the dot is from this circle, the stronger it is. So pretty weak, we'll say weak active phase over the... East Pacific, almost getting ready to move through Central America, and over the next two weeks, making it to North Africa. The dynamic model suggests pretty much the same thing, but maybe the active phase making it to the Indian Ocean, still very weak. So again, nothing forecast in the West Pacific or East Pacific for the next two weeks. 
And that pretty much corroborates what we saw in the previous model, the 40-day run of the model, with the inactive phase pushing over the Pacific for the next 30 days, we'll say. All right, the CFS model going out a month from the 31st of July to the 28th of August. Um, a whole plan on one chart. This is the east-west component of the wind. Uh, the oranges, reds, whatever you want to call it, are westerly anomalies. That would be the active phase of the MJO. The blues, the inactive phase of the MJO. All right, now also, okay, so the West Pacific starts at 135 east, so right, right about here. And the date line is right there. Kel so Kelvin wave generation area is this box here. The solid black contour is the active phase of the MJO, moving from west to east from the maritime continent around July 17th. Today, it is over the core of the Kelvin wave generation area, producing scattered light westerly anomalies, and scheduled to continue off passing south of California about a week and a half from now with westerly anomalies. So someone asked, well, does the active phase support tropical storm development? Well, clearly there is one, two, three, four, five different tropical systems that did form during this active phase of the MJO. But you can also see here during a completely neutral uh, sort of maybe even bordering on inactive phase, you also get some tropical activity. But theoretically, the answer is yes. When you have the active phase of the MJO, especially if it's strong enough, it creates that westerly wind burst, and that's really what just can just it acts like a, a a steam shovel pushing westerly winds along the equator, and that in turn stirs up a lot of tropical activity. Anyway, all right. So moving a week out, inactive phase of the MJO starts building over the maritime continent. East, the associated easterly anomalies set up. It moves into the Kelvin wave generation area about mid-August and then kind of dies, but you see easterly anomalies continuing off to the east through the end of the model run through August. So August, after about the next couple of days, pretty much it is a dud, and we already know from looking at the models that there's really nothing forecast for the next five days. So even this inactive phase, given it's so weak, is not really going to do anything. So when in doubt, look further out, we say. All right. So um, this is the three-month CFS model. Um, you can't see it here. Um, but here, maybe we can zoom out. Just uh, zoom out. Okay, there we go. Now we got it all in. You can see this. All right. So dateline running right up the middle here. This is past performance. The forecast is up here. Um uh, Kelvin wave generation area starts right about here, 135 east. So you look from here right up over in this area now. And what's really striking is this big patch of blue. That's easterly anomalies. The yellows are the westerly anomalies. So our only window we're seeing is westerly anomalies. That would typically be associated with the active phase of the MJO. Pushing into the Kelvin wave generation area as we get into the first week of September, and holding in some fashion even into October, but not making very much headway off to the east with east anomalies in control. Irrespective of active or inactive phase, it's that west anomaly thing that really, that is what feeds the jet stream and does all the good stuff that we need for storm development. We're not necessarily seeing anything obvious here. Let's overlay the MJO pattern. All right, so here we are today, active phase, the solid contour, active phase, the MJO. It is fading as it's pushing across the Pacific. Inactive phase of the MJO, this dotted contour forecast starting you know, about August 5th, something like that. And continuing through the Kelvin wave generation area into September 10th. Then in the east here, yeah, I mean in the west, the active phase of the MJO starts setting up. August 25th into early September with the westerly anomalies. So that would be our big target for maybe storm production would be first week of September into the end of September, September 26th. But notice east anomalies here kind of dampening things. Inactive phase forecast after that, but still with some weak westerly anomalies continuing. And then another active phase after that as we get into early October, Westerly anomalies making it just to the far west Pacific and not even really getting in the Kelvin wave generation area. What's going on? 
Well, here you go. This is the real teller here. The uh, low pass filter, the dotted contour is a high pressure bias, the solid contour, low pressure bias. Think of this as La Nina, and that is El Nino, or however you want to look at it. So this is last April, May, but it was even all the last winter. High pressure, one, two, three, four contours was in control. It faded. It's almost gone now. And you go, that is great. But also notice the low pressure bias is fading out too. So the MJO isn't getting any nudge from either of these uh, as we get into the first, second week of August. But then notice the high pressure bias starts rebuilding, but not over here south of California. Right smack on the dateline from one contour to two contours as we get into the end of September. And the low pressure bias, which we want to see right over the dateline, instead gets uh, retrograded west over the Indian Ocean maritime continent. And that likely is the setup for this winter with a sort of revenge of La Nina, a much weaker form of La Nina, but still. Basically, high pressure bias and control of the Pacific, that tends to mean lesser storms, weaker storms, um, not as much wind energy associated with them. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be storms, because clearly last winter we were in La Nina, and we had, we had five weeks of just off-the-chart surf, but it was all condensed down into this one little window, and the rest of the winter, as far as I'm concerned, was pretty much just non-existent. So uh, will that happen this year? Who knows? We're going to see, but right now, and again, we're looking at a model three months out. Do you believe that? No. But this model... The, the CFS model is pretty good in a very general sense as to what's going to come. This high pressure, low pressure bias thing, that's what we count on. The strength of these MJO things, and when you start diving into the details, it definitely gets, you know, things change dramatically a month or two months out. But the high low pressure bias, as best we've seen, is pretty accurate. All right, so let's go look out. It's actually longer term, but let's let's pass the MJO, which is like this four week on four weeks of active phase, four weeks of inactive phase, and let's go look at the El Nino thing. And the way we could do that, three different things we're looking at. What's going on down deep in the ocean, what's going on at the surface of the ocean, and what's going on in the atmosphere above the ocean. It is the interaction of of the ocean and the atmosphere, and when they get coupled together and locked in a pattern, that can either be really good, you know, if it's El Nino, that means there's low pressure in the atmosphere, there's warm water in the ocean, there's piles of evaporation, and that just adds gasoline to the storm machine in the southern hemisphere in the summer months and in the northern hemisphere in the winter months. But then when you get La Nina, you have cold water in the ocean that supports high pressure aloft and high pressure, no matter how you look at it, isn't, doesn't do anything for storm production and therefore you have a lackluster surf season and dry air over California and drought. All right, so we're going to start deep in the ocean. East Pacific here, West Pacific here, data from the TAO buoy array, that series of buoys strung across the equator. Um, these are the anchor lines on those buoys. Yes, the whole way across the Pacific, anchored, who knows how deep it is out there, 5,000 feet deep, 5,000 feet of chain, right? And then they stick sensors on the, on the anchor chains and use that, have it all uh, connect to the buoy up top, radio it off via satellite to a central processing facility, take that raw data, apply a model to it, fill in the gaps. And what do you get? Profile of the subsurface ocean temperatures. And you go, well, what's that mean? Well, we'll explain that. All right, so right now, warm water in the West Pacific. This is centigrade, 29 degrees centigrade, 28 degrees centigrade. That's pretty warm water. Uh, backtracking to 170 west it had been over at 160 west a good part of the summer backtracking so warm water both here and here receding to the west the 24 degree isotherm which had been pushing the whole way into um, um, uh, ecuador all summer 
again backtracking to 120 west that's just due south of california so these are actual temperatures what does all this mean when we talked about the kelvin wave generation area and we talk about warm water moving from west to east when you get the active phase of the mjo over the west pacific it reverses the trade winds the trade winds start coming from the west takes this warm water here starts pushing it off to the east and you'll get a ball of warm water tracking from west to east and you'll see these lines start pushing this way you'll see the flow of warm water to the east uh, you can see it clear more clearly here anomalies the differences from normal for this time of year now this is kind of an interesting chart we have been watching warm water well there's warm water here at one centigrade one degree centigrade above normal in the west pacific and there is a stream of it flowing the whole way into the east pacific this is remnants hangover from three kelvin waves that have traversed the pacific but the a uh, thing that we don't want to see, but we are seeing, is three degree below normal temperatures here uh, and pushing off to the east, the opposite of a Kelvin wave. And we suspect at some point it's going to breach the surface in around here and start cooling things down. In fact, we see that surface temperatures and going down what is that? Well, that's 100 meters, that's 50, so that's 25. So we'll, we'll say 25 meters down, about 75 meters deep. Temperatures are actually already below normal on the surface here. And this might be actually overstated the amount of warmth here. In fact, there's another model. Wouldn't you know it? There's another model that says the situation is even not as good as what we saw in the previous one. This is the same raw data, just a different model. Warm water, all balled up in the West Pacific. Cool water, what is this? One, two, three, four. So we'll say one, two, three, four. Two to three degrees below normal here. Poised to erupt to the surface. You can already see cold water or cooler water building on the surface from 100 west. So that's like south of mainland Mexico. The whole way across the dateline and beyond. Um, and again, cool water supports what? High pressure in the atmosphere. And high pressure, of course, doesn't support precipitation or energy transfer to the jet stream. So this already suggests the underpinnings of a return of La Nina are in flight. Sea surface height anomalies. These are not temperatures, this is height. The sphere of the ocean. You strip out the waves, strip out the wind waves, strip out the tide. Okay. And what you see is, oh, where are we? Okay. South America here. There's Chile, Peru. There's Ecuador, Central America, Mexico, Yucatan Peninsula right there, Baja, uh, Hawaii. There's the equator, EQ. There's the dateline right there. There's um, New Guinea. All right, so what we see is 5 to 10 centimeter below normal uh, sea surface heights. What's that mean? Well, typically cold water at depth contracts, creates a divot on the ocean surface, sort of a dig out. Okay, and that's what we're seeing here. So that infers that there's cold water at depth. And of course, if trades are stronger than normal, then they're scraping out yet more water, pushing it off to the west. You can see it. The positive anomalies are here in the far west Pacific, suggesting trades blowing stronger than normal. And you're getting, beginning to get this, what they call the horseshoe pattern, where you see the high, the heights are over here, and they sort of bow off to the east, north of the equator, and south of the equator. This guy here has been here all summer long, suggesting that some sense of La Nina has been going on, even though we had positive anomalies during previous couple of previous Kelvin waves. The underpinnings of La Nina have remained in the atmosphere all summer long. Upper ocean heat anomalies. All right, so West Pacific here, East Pacific here, back in August, September last year. Cold water in the East Pacific. Where's the date line? 180 West, right there. So cold water pretty much filling the whole East Pacific. Uh, La Nina, this is the hallmark of La Nina. Big stable high pressure right over top of that. Peaking out in Halloween time frame and somewhere around March things changed. Warm water here, active phase of the MJO pushing over the West Pacific producing a Kelvin wave, warm water flowing to the east. One Kelvin wave, number two, another one produced in like April, a third weaker one in June, and then 
It all dies out, and here's the beginning of the buildup of the cold water, just like we, what we got here. This this actually started in like April last year. Now this much later in the July time frame, the later in the season a major transition starts, typically the weaker it is. So this does not suggest some raging La Nina return, just a a strong hint of it, if you will, maybe a little bit more, um, but certainly not what we went through last year. Um, with, but still, it looks like a developing La Nina signal. All right, so what's going on on the ocean surface? This high res data, five kilometer um, uh, per pixel, which is pretty pretty high resolution, the latest and greatest. Uh, South America, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, the Galapagos, Central America. The equator right along there or you know it's kind of not quite overlaid perfectly you get the idea date lines out here all right so what do we have we have a lot of warm water but it's all confined to about 110 west or east of there so confined to the far east pacific the main part of the pacific on the equator it's five degrees north and south of the equator that that's all that matters it's hard to believe but Everything in the entire Pacific and the whole planet really is dictated by what's happening five degrees north and south of the equator across, we won't even say the width of the Pacific. We'll say at south of California, the whole way across the Pacific, but really we think most of it starts about 170 west. So it's over here and beyond. We'll take a look at that. But you get the general idea. The yellow is orange. It's warmer than normal temperatures. Yeah, it's pretty warm over the Galapagos. But we think this is hangover from those previous Kelvin waves. And the cool signal starting to build from south of Baja the whole way across. The seven-day trend. Blues are cooling waters. Reds are warmer. But again, it's only five. Here's the equator right there. It's zero. So five degrees north and south of the equator. Ignore all this burning hot stuff or cold stuff up here. That's all. We could talk uh, quite a bit about it, but it's immaterial for right now. And what you see is cold, 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 little pockets of warm, but the balance definitely cold from, yeah, from the Galapagos out to about a point south of Hawaii, but likely building more. You can see little shades of blue building in there. That wasn't there last week, all the way out to the dateline. The backed off view, again, South America, Central America, the equator is right there. Cold or cooling temperature or cooler than normal temperatures is sea surface temperature anomalies. Differences from normal for this time of year. Cooling temperatures from 110 west out to the date lines right there. Um, the Nino, this is for reference, Nino 1.2 region, I think it goes out to about 100 or 110 west, something like that. So right there. This is a noisy area. We're not going to pay much attention to that. The official El Nino monitoring region temperatures right here from 120 west, 5 degrees north and south of the equator, out to 170 west. So right there. And then the Kelvin wave generation area is out here. Notice there's a lot of warm water here. If we had the active phase of the MJO and if it had any strength and pushed across here, it could take warm water, start transporting it in here. But it can't because, again, we talked that high low pressure bias. We think the high pressure bias is, is building right in this area. And the low pressure bias is transitioning over here somewhere. So that doesn't do anything for the Pacific Ocean. And we think that pattern is only going to dig in more as we get into winter. All right, so we talked subsurface temperatures. We talked surface temperatures. Now, we're not going to talk temperatures, but what's going on in the atmosphere above the ocean in the Pacific? Look at the Southern Oscillation Index. Difference of pressure between Darwin, Australia, and Tahiti. Darwin, pretty much over the Indian Ocean. Tahiti, over the Pacific. When lower pressure is in Tahiti, the index goes negative. Today's value, minus 1.58, which is next to nothing. It's dead neutral. But look what it's been doing for the past month. Oh, 30, plus 33, plus 37, and nary a negative reading anywhere other than 
here and that could as easily be weak low pressure moving over to Tahiti for a day or two so the index will drop remember that low pressure system is that's falling uh from north of new zealand south and supposed to build a little bit of fetch it for mainly for hawaii in the next couple of days that's probably what's driving this minus 1.5 all right but this is noisy so let's go look at the 30-day average this is your active inactive phase of the mjo indicator well 14.84 what was it yesterday 15.16 pretty positive all positive and going from 2.3 a month ago up to 16 that's not good that suggests at least a very very strong inactive phase of the mjo 90 day average that takes even more noise out of it that's your el nino la nina indicator well, we moved from 2.66 a month ago up to 7.46. So everything suggests the inactive phase, high pressure, whatever you want to call it, is building over the Pacific. The general trend is favorable for high pressure, not going the other way, not dropping, not becoming favorable for low pressure. A 30-day moving SOI average graphed out once it goes back to January 2019. So, again, if the index is negative, there's zero. These are all negative. You go above the line, you're positive. So this is your La Nina range. This is your El Nino range down here. Weak La Nina, I mean, weak El Nino back in 2019. Then we got into 2020, and it was somewhere right around April. Things kicked off and started moving towards uh, uh, La Nina. These are the inactive phases of the MJO. This is active phase. And then you got in July 2020, boom, up, down a little, up sky high as we got into January this year. And things have been backing off lately. But look at this, another big upward spike, suggesting again, moving well into La Nina territory. And that's actual data that's actually happened as of now we're not talking forecasts so you really can't argue with that this is the the ground state right now is favoring la nina the cfs version 2 forecast for sea surface temperatures in the nino 3.4 region the official el nino monitoring region remember negative temperatures colder than normal temperatures suggest la nina all right so October last year, temperatures were down a degree and a quarter. And then as we got into the spring and the summer, temperatures briefly hit neutral or a tenth of a degree below normal in June and pretty much held into July. But the trend from here on is down, down, down. This is worse than last week. I think last week we were three quarters of a degree below normal. This week, the model suggesting down to a degree below normal. Now, this is probably this is the uncorrected data but then the good news is as we get into spring of next year back to normal so this is the here's the main la nina dip here's the second year la nina double dip let's go look at the here we are the uh the pdf corrected version and it's suggesting well it's still suggesting temperatures and we'll say 0.8 degrees below normal, something like that. So um, that suggests that um, still some anything more than a half a degree below normal is La Nina. In fact, we forgot to look at actual sea surface temperatures. Let's do that real quick. Temperatures in the 1.2 region, dead neutral, plus 0.14 degree. And they've been holding pretty neutral. And you looked at the charts. We saw things were pretty warm there right off Ecuador. But in the official El Nino monitoring region, this is actual hard data. Temperatures peaked around the 4th of July. They've been downward ever since. According to this, as of August 1st, three quarters of a degree below normal, 247 thousandths of a degree below normal. So not even in La Nina territory yet, but halfway there uh, suggests a cooling trend. Let's go look at the model. And for the end of July, the model says, okay, it's saying 0.35. So it's off by a 10th of a degree, roughly. I mean, I guess there's different ways you can, there's definitely different ways you can measure temperature uh and and you know verse and so th there is a little bit of room for wiggle room but this is probably a pretty good representation of what's going on if not then this one here maybe that actually is a little bit uh, uh closer to the truth either way suggests la nina for the future
So the good news is, right now there is a swell on the way. It's actually tickling the buoys, so maybe there'll be something to ride for the next couple of days. Nothing huge, but rideable from the southern hemisphere. Make the most of it. There is literally nothing else on the charts relative to California. Hawaii, maybe a little bit, you know, a week and a half out or something, but nothing huge, pretty short period kind of thing, uh, 13 seconds. And after that... It looks like the doldrums of summer are going to set in. We can hope at best for wind swell. Long term after that, yeah, we want fall to come, but probably it's going to be a late start, start to fall. This is typically what happens during these double dip La Ninas. It takes a while to get going, so it'll be maybe more like October. Or so, And we know the inactive phase, the MJO, is pretty much going to wipe out the whole month of August anyway. So sometime mid-September is our next shot for something meaningful. That doesn't mean we won't get surprised and the southern hemi could wake up. But statistically speaking, the odds do not favor it. So that would mean if you got business to take care of, go ahead and do it. Go work, work your overtime, do whatever you got to do, um, and then keep your schedule flexible for maybe as we get into September. All right, if you enjoyed the video, there we go, give us a thumbs up. Comments, questions, concerns, write your question. We'll reply back to you. Um, we'll do our best to answer your questions honestly and truthfully. We certainly won't lie. We'll just tell you we don't know if we don't know. Um, uh, if you haven't subscribed, you can see the video. All the data is on stormsurf.com. Go there. Um, the top pay of every page of the site will have a link to the video as soon as we post it here in just a little bit. You can watch it that way. And other than that, well, I hope you enjoyed it. And go surfing or do whatever you're going to do. Stay in shape the best and safest way you can so that when we finally do get real surf, you can make the most of it. All right. Thank you. Oh, and next week we will not be doing a video. We're going to take the uh, weekend off and go have a little fun, but we'll be back the week after that. We are on our new computer. The computer is stable. The cameras are all working. The mics are working and we didn't have any problems tonight. So that is a huge stress relief for myself. All right. So thank you and we'll see you in two weeks. Have a good one. Thank you.